In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Christ is born. Today we celebrate a, a beautiful saint who died in 1908. Uh, that's right, 1908, which is not too long ago. And uh, a Russian saint who we have his icon here in the church. So I have my, my laser, my right here on the bottom. The saint right here, the first saint on the right underneath St. John. is St. John, St. John of Kronstadt. And I wanted to take a moment to read his sermon when he was ordained. Now, St. John was considered one of the greatest saints in the history of Russia. In fact, when he would travel, um, everywhere he went, thousands of people would flock around him uh, and just to, just to get a glimpse of him and to look, look at him. Like I mentioned in a sermon last year about him, many times people would send him letters because he is considered a, a, a wonder worker. He had uh, performed by God's grace so many miracles throughout his life that it was impossible for him to see everyone, but people would send letters to him and write letters to him, and as they would write their letters to him, they would be healed when he would read the letters. So he could be all the way across the world in Russia, and someone could write him from China and send him a letter, and when he read the letter requesting their prayer, that person was healed from across the globe. So St. John was a, a married saint, uh, he married the daughter of uh, a priest, and uh, not much is written about her, but St. John, we have plenty of things that were written about him in his life, and much of what we know about how he thought and how he um, pastored was written in his diary called My Life in Christ. But this is his ordination speech, and I wanted to read it to you because um, it's, a, it's a beautiful uh, sermon. And it's about feed my lambs. So if you think about when Christ spoke to his disciples, especially St. Peter, he said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Right? He speaks to him and says, go out and do these things. And he also asks St. Peter, do you love me? And, and St. Peter responds three times, I love you. So this is St. John's sermon um, given well over 100 years ago, but um, still speaks to us today. It's called feed my lambs. These words of the supreme chief pastor, Christ, are familiar to all of us, my brethren, because you have not infrequently heard of them during the reading of the gospel at all night vigils on Saturdays, and you know also to whom they were said. I will repeat them as they were said to the apostle Peter, and they were said thrice as a sign of the threefold reinstatement of the apostle who had three times renounced his Lord. The Lord mystically addresses these same words to us also, unworthy pastors of his spiritual flock, when he calls us through the medium of a bishop to the pastoral service of the priesthood. The Lord's words reached also the ears of my own heart, feed my lambs, commanding me to feed you his spiritual lambs. I am aware of the exaltedness of the office and the responsibilities attached to it, I can feel my frailty and unworthiness in carrying out the highest calling on earth, that of a priest. But I am relying on the grace and mercy of God, healing the weak and replenishing the failing. I know what is capable of making me more or less worthy of this office and am able to carry out this calling. It is love towards Christ and to you, my, my beloved brethren. This is why the Lord also in reinstating the disciple who had renounced him in the rank of apostle, asked him three times, do you love me? And after each one of his answers, I love you, repeated to him, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Love is a great force. It makes even the weak strong and the small great and the insignificant worthy of deep respect and hitherto unknown and strange. It soon makes close and am amiable. Such is the nature of pure evangelical love. May the Lord, who is full of love towards all, grant also me to spark that of love, that he may inflame it within me, the Holy Spirit. Exalted, I said, is the calling of a priest. For whose office is it? It is Christ's office. He is the only high priest, the first and the last, offering a sacrifice and being brought in as a sacrifice for all. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. We are arrayed with the grace of his priesthood. 
He himself officiates in us and through us. Consequently, we ourselves must also deeply honor our office, and you, brethren, must for your own worthiness and salvation deeply honor this office and submit to the bearers of it, being indulgent towards their frailties and deficiencies. For although we are exalted by our office, our nature is the same as yours, weak and subject to stumbling. And what mortal human can fully measure up to the height and holiness of the office of the priesthood? If we are to take it into consideration only one thing, that a priest standing before the very throne of God in an earthly church must so often perform the life-endowing awesome mysteries of Christ, must intercede for the instruction and guidance of the church on behalf of the whole world for the welfare of God's churches in the whole universe and the unification of all, the, of all dissenters to bring an offering of gratitude for all saints, forefathers, patriarchs, prophets, apostles, evangelists, martyrs, the ascetics, and for all blessed souls to pray for the living and the dead, then what an angelic worthiness is required for that? Is this a task for our frailty when we, on account of our own sins, would not dare open our mouths even for ourselves so as to implore heavenly justice and mercy for our own sins? No, this is the work of the highest grace. This is the work of the countless good things which Christ has done for us. He is the interceder and the one who accepts intercessions. Well, if we are to take into consideration also the performance of the rest of the mysteries, particularly baptism, confession, marriage, extreme unction, what holiness is required? What a wealth of Christ's love from the priest performing these sacraments. For in all prayers and officiations, belonging to the content of the sacraments, there breathes the spirit of God's infinite love towards the human race, the spirit of mercy, extreme condescension, sanctity, and incorruptibility. Yet again, there is the preaching of God's word, the proclaiming of the eternal truths of the gospel in a language readily understandable by all, imbued with a spiritual and evangelical love so as to teach, enlighten, correct, confirm, guide along the path leading to eternity. What a lofty and difficult duty this is. Without a doubt, the grace of God will help us in everything, if we be worthy of it. And if you will try to walk in or live worthy of your lofty Christian calling, and so here, brothers and sisters, is my first word to you in church, with which I make your acquaintance, except with an open, straightforward, and kind heart. Accept me into your love and remember me before the Lord in your prayers, which you daily rise up to him. I will conclude with this apostolic blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. It's a beautiful speech about the calling of the priests and the calling of the Christians. But one thing I wanted you to think about, it's, it's very rich, right? The language is very rich. It's very, um, um, very proper, very educated. But what I wanted to let you know is that St. John had a very difficult time as a young boy spelling, speaking, writing. And he prayed over and over to God. He was the worst student in his class as a young child. He had, for those who have had children or been a child that had learning difficulties in an early age, St. John had them as well. And the more he prayed, the stronger he became. And at the end of his time in seminary, he was at the top of his class. And you hear from his words, his, his eloquent way of speaking, that there is nothing holding him back. But what has brought him to that is God's grace. But I wanted to read this to you because this is just one letter of many of his thoughts that were written down that we have. And I think we, at one point, had his book in the bookstore, My Life in Christ, which is a very uh, powerful writing of his daily journal. And I wanted you to, to know a little bit about him and to think about him on this day as one of the, the great saints in the Russian um, uh, tradition and also in our tradition, but one of the great saints in Russian history in, in recent time, who was also not only um, a healer, not only um, a miracle worker, but also prophetic in many of the things that he said and did. 
So I wanted to leave you with that today. And one other thing that I wanted to talk about today that I had been thinking about is, is there a three-year-old child in the church today? Anybody have a three-year-old here? Nobody? Oh, there you go. All right. All right, so hold up your three-year-old a second. Okay? Everybody remember what it looks like to look three years old, right? Um, one of the things, you know, I, I was thinking, too, in, in the past days of, of Christmas was of Christ being born. And I know that this is the Sunday before Christmas, and we come to um, uh, this, this beautiful, it's Sophia, right? Sophia, can she come up in front? I don't know if she'll do that, but come on, Sophia, it's Father Peter, you know me. Come here a second. I'll give you something nice after church for coming up here. Okay. All right. Okay. You're going to stand right here. You're, you're on stage today. Okay. So Sophia is three years old. And in the, in the church, there's a particular saint that we have in the altar, and one of the martyrs in the church, who was three years old when they were martyred. But one of the things that I wanted to tell you was that our church is consecrated with three relics of martyrs. There's St. Haralambos, there's St. Boniface, who we celebrated yesterday, and St. Kirikos, who was three years old. And St. Kirikos was the child of his mother, and his mother was a Christian, and as she was being tortured, the ruler took St. Kirikos, who was three, and took him up in, on, the, on the stairs of the, the, the place where he was, way up on a staircase, and held him and St. Kirikos says, I'm a Christian, and I love Christ. And he starts saying it over and over and over. And the, the ruler at the time got mad, and he, what he did is he, he took St. Kirikos, who was three, and he threw him down the staircase. And uh, St. Kirikos was martyred. He died. But what I wanted to remind you of is in this time where we celebrate Christ's birth, that we have in our altar, inside, enshrined in the altar table, St. Kirikos' relics who is a three-year-old who, like I would mention about St. John, who had a difficulty speaking, that through the grace of God and through the love of his mother and through the love of God, that St. Kirikos at a small age was able to proclaim how much he loved Christ and stood up for Christ. And I know Sophia loves God too, right? Yep. You excited about Christmas? Me too. You getting any dolls? Yeah, you're going to get something cool? All right, thanks, Sophia. You can go sit down now. So three years old. So the reason I wanted to tell you that was just so that you could think a little bit about the, how God permeates all of us at any age. From St. John, who um, was struggling to speak, and through the grace of God was able to put everything together and to write such a beautiful homily and to become a miracle worker in our church from St. Kitikos, who was the smallest of ages and who proclaimed uh, Christ. And then what he did is he actually scratched the face of the ruler and then became one of the youngest martyrs in the church. One of the youngest martyrs in the church. And we have his relics enshrined in our altar table. So I wanted to remind you that as you come up for communion, as you receive God's blessing, and as you see uh, the priests all the time, Right? Every time we come out for an entrance, the priest kisses the gospel, he kisses the altar table. Why do we kiss the altar table? Because it's the place where we offer the, the Holy Communion, but also inside are the, the relics of St. Kirikos, St. Haralambos, St. Boniface, and also um, the 40 martyrs, which are, if I have my light, are over there. So those are the 40 martyrs down there on the bottom, where the light is, and St. Boniface is in the back. So he's another one that's in the altar table. See in the back, right there. And then St. Haralambos is here. So these are the saints that are in our altar table, along with St. Kirikos, who is this small child. So as you remember children during this time, remember some of the children who were martyred and who stood up for the faith. Another one is St. Irene right here, a small child who, who also suffered um, in Greece, uh, martyrdom. Uh, so keep... Keep them as your uh, 
um, intercessors and to speak to them. If you have a child um, that needs protection, if you have um, uh, a child that is um, in need of, of learning, um, pray to these saints, St. Saint John, St. Kirikos, and St. Irene, all these um, young saints who were there. Um, there's also other saints too that I could go on and speak about, but I wanted to remind you that they're always here. They're here. And St. Kirikos, the small child who, who proclaimed Christ, is here today inside our altar table as he was yesterday and from the time of the consecration of the church. May these children, may St. John and all the saints who proclaim Christ with such grace and such love in their heart, may they continue to strengthen us so that we can proclaim Christ as well. Amen.